Bonjour and good morning. Uh, in the spirit of the two-part process of the negative positive, um, we're, we're going to present to you a two-part presentation. So I'll speak um, for a little while and then my colleague Sarah Freeman will um, speak. Um, but we are very honored and happy to be here and to be part of a symposium around the calotype, a topic so fundamental, foundational to the medium of photography and to its history. We are also extremely empowered to be standing in a location not very far from where some of the initial discoveries and experiments with paper negatives were made, which is not where we typically stand in Los Angeles. Um, I want to start by introducing the exhibition Real Ideal Photography in France, 1847 to 1860, which was presented in the Getty Museum Center for Photographs from the end of August to the end of November of 2016. The exhibition focused on photographs made in France during the first two decades after the introduction of a paper negative process by Blenkar Evrard in 1847. At the time that the exhibition was being planned, the Getty Museum's collection of early French photography had not been on view for many years, and much of it had um, never been published or um, exhibited. So there were many options as to how to approach this rich period in photography, uh, and many important photographers that could have been included. Um, but finally, uh, four photographers were selected as the main figures of the exhibition, Gustave Le Gray, Henri Le Sec, Charles Neg, and Edouard Baldus. And indeed, these are some of the most well-known names um, in the history of photography, even to Los Angeles um, locals. Uh, they were selected because they are, are held in some depth in the Getty Collection, but also because they uh, were active during a particularly crucial period uh, in photography. Uh, between the introduction of the paper negative in the 1840s and the proliferation of photomechanical technology and more standardized materials for photography in the 1860s. So rather than treat the photographers separately, I decided to intertwine their work thematically through the galleries and to include the work of some of their contemporaries as well. The exhibition was structured around the various ways these photographers explored the medium through depictions of architecture, genre scenes, nature studies, and still lifes. A particular focus was how their approaches to their chosen subjects, as well as to the paper negative positive process, um, were in dialogue with the notions of real and ideal, notions critical to understanding and defining the character of photography from its beginnings and also linked to broader changes in literature and in painting during the same period when novelists and painters were abandoning idealized subjects for real people and objects of everyday life. Well, although we were very proud that the exhibition included many photographs um, from the collection that the um, Getty and Los Angeles public had not seen for um, at least over a decade, if ever. Um, the success of the exhibition actually really depended on several very important loans, so I just want to point out some of those loans and institutions as well. But one of the most important elements of the story, and indeed why Sarah and I are here today, is that each of these four, uh, as well as their contemporaries, such as uh, Ringo on the screen, um, printed their positives from paper negatives. Therefore, it was critical to this project that we not only show positive prints, but that we also convey the magnitude of the paper negative to this period, um, and to do so by making it possible for visitors to really see the negatives, um, um, and also to see as many as possible. Um, you know, bigger is better, but <laughs> not true. But, um, but in this case, we wanted to see what we could do, um, because we had the... Um, um, a recent acquisition that um, came in in 2015. Um, we still had quite a small number. We had only 12 after that acquisition. Prior to it, we had five um, negatives that we attributed to French makers. Um, so I know it's a very small number in comparison to what's in, in Paris, but we were quite excited about it. Um, 
And so we, we decided to kind of make this a moment where we're shifting um, perhaps what we, how we think about what is important to collect in the um, Department of Photographs um, and uh, also what's important to be included in exhibitions. Um, as no French paper negatives had been shown before, this was kind of a moment we seized to um, make that um, visibly important. Even though the paper negative is fundamental to the possibility of the positive print, there are a couple of reasons that it has rarely been displayed in exhibitions on 19th century photography and, and as a result of that largely unexamined in histories or vice versa. It is, as we all know, a very light sensitive object and it is also very hard to see. Um, which is probably its greatest fault. Um, as the negative by nature is the opposite of the positive image our eyes are more accustomed to viewing um, in exhibition um, especially. The question then was how to display paper negatives physically in the space and to display them for an audience in the context of a museum on the west coast of the United States. As Sarah will illuminate, the incorporation of negatives into the real ideal exhibition involved a number of people and departments inside and outside of the museum. But I will just give a brief glimpse of what the issues were from a curatorial standpoint. The first question was where to place them in the galleries. Should they have their own separate gallery or should they be included alongside a positive prints? They are integral to the process, of course, of making a positive print. However, they require substantially uh, lower light levels than their positives um, in most cases. The first gallery um, of the Center for Photographs, um, and this is just an overview slide, um, receives a lot of ambient light from two different entrance, entrance ways, making the intensity of the illumination very hard to um, see in the gallery. So we decided to display all of the negatives in one designated gallery at the midway point of the exhibition. You can see the entrance to it on the far right of the left slide. Um, in the first three galleries then, viewers were able to walk through a series of positive prints and they um, would then enter a separate gallery that um, created a more intimate experience with the negative positive process. The light and orientation of the negative gallery gave visitors a chance to look very closely and compare negatives by Le Gray, Le Sec, Baldus, and Negre, as well as um, many of their contemporaries. Um, in a few instances, negatives were installed next to their positive counterpoint, and Sarah will show you how we did that. Um, Another consideration was whether, so first it was where to put them, then the consideration was um, um, about the display. And um, one of the questions that we had was whether a negative, particularly a wax paper negative, has a recto and a verso, has a front and a back, really, um, because we're, of course, with positive prints, we show the recto, the, the, the front. Um, is there a correct side to face the viewer when put on display? We discovered from looking at known positives from some of the negatives that photographers printed from various sides of the negative, either with the light sensitive side turned down towards the paper or up. And because negatives were variantly coated with or immersed in the sensitizing material, the negatives image side also varied. So that made it even more confounding when searching for a front of the object for display. Um, for the purposes today, um, for my purposes today, I'll just use the term recto to indicate the side holding the sensitizing material and verso for the side with less sensitizing material. Um, and as you will see, both sides were matted and framed facing out towards the viewer in the exhibition. Um, the example I have is um, this one, um, Charles Negg's Notre Dame. Um, we uh, displayed it with the side facing the, the recto side facing outward toward the viewer. Um, and it was also more visible by ordinary light. So when, um, as Sarah will show you, the push button technology we use, but um, because we, you could only view the um, transmitted version of the negative when you had your finger on the push button um, for um, while the uh, button was not pushed, you could still see the negative quite well. Where, um, uh, and then that's compared to um, around on the other side of the temporary wall, we were showing um, a negative of Saint-Gilles. This is actually the same site and photographer that um, 
was presented yesterday from the Rijksmuseum. Um, and it was the verso side or the unsensitive side um, that uh, faced out in the exhibition. Um, as you can see from the orientation of the negative in ordinary lighting, which is on the far right, um, part of that decision came about actually because it, if we had put the sensitized um, side facing out, Negra's inscription at lower right would not have read legibly as he apparently signed the negative in ink on the verso. You can also see that negatives taken on ver take on very pers different personas when they are lit versus when they are unlit. And that was another argument for displaying them variantly um, and not always in the same way so that um, visitors could understand that there's just multifarious ways that these negatives exist. Um, Apart from showing the negative with its positive, it was also important to give the viewer the sense of um, that these were these negatives were objects on pieces of paper, um, and to see that even um, negatives made by the same photographer um, could take on very different tonalities and hues and shapes and sizes. Um, so we designed some display cases that the um, visitor, it, it, it presented the negatives as if um, they were kind of laid out on a table surface and the visitor could look down on them. We also um, didn't overmat the negatives so that um, the uh, viewer could look at them as entire pieces of paper. Um, uh, and we did feel that it, we overmatted the negatives then, um, and they're in a case, um, um, like the table case on the right, they would um, lose their sense of paperness and would look li just like these sort of um, floating digital, digitized image, illuminated images on screens. But speaking of screens, we did actually include a screen um, in the negative gallery uh, that showed negatives, um, particularly two negatives that uh, were deemed too light sensitive to um, uh, present in person. So um, uh, we presented the Tarascon and then next to it on the far right, you see a tiny little screen um, was an iPad where you could uh, zoom into um, the negatives and look at the details. Um, in a way that you couldn't with um, in the rest of the gallery. Um, you could also toggle between um, negative and positive. Uh, uh, and they were high resolution images. So you could you were able to kind of look at a spot on the negative and then toggle to the positive area and see what that particular area looked like in the positive um, alter ego version. What was ultimately important and hopefully successful was to transport contemporary viewers from Los Angeles and internationally away from our present image-saturated society to a time when making and looking at images was incredibly different from the way it is today. It is important for museums to preserve these kinds of objects and it is important to put them on display so that others can see them, recognize them, and appreciate them. Welcome to the Negative Gallery. In this view, you can see a push button backlit display, <coughs> a, a push button display for a backlit negative paired with a related positive image of the Notre Dame Cathedral, which has been installed on a temporary wall in the gallery interior. And along the far wall, there are three groupings of negatives installed side by side with corresponding salted paper prints. In this presentation, I'll provide a detailed description of the design and manufacture process for the mounts and display systems for the negatives that were included in the exhibition, as well as some of the preliminary examination techniques that helped guide our decision to display a selection of the negatives. Paper negatives are often very fragile due to coatings and decorative finishes. They're sensitive to handling and light exposure for this exhibition, mounting and display techniques were customized for each negative to ensure minimal contact with the fragile surfaces. The galleries were lit with the Sora LED spot light fixtures, which are UV filtered and dimmed to lower light levels appropriate for these materials. <coughs> Here are detailed images showing three examples of the display techniques that were used for paper negatives in the exhibition. 
Karen chose to include pairings of negatives and positives that could be displayed with a traditional overmat and frame presentation using reflected illumination as shown at the left. Three negatives were displayed floated within a frame using push button activated backlit illumination and nine negatives, including three loans, were displayed flat within table cases, also with push button illumination. You can observe with the image of the table case at the far right that the ambient light levels were very low to optimize back, backlit viewing and protect the negatives from excess light exposure. When Karen was developing the exhibition, she approached me about her interest in highlighting the positive negative process and specifically the aesthetic qualities and technical achievements of paper negatives. After learning that very few had been displayed in the Gettys galleries, I decided to contact colleagues at other institutions. I was very fortunate to see the Linnaeus Tripe exhibition while attending a conference on platinum printing organized by the National Gallery of Art in the fall of 2014. The exhibition featured wax paper negatives and extensive technical summaries about Tripe's photographic process. Negatives were displayed next to related positive prints with push button activi activation for backlit illumination. Visitors had the opportunity to observe the negatives in two ways. Sarah Wagner, photograph conservator at the National Gallery of Art, generously shared her expertise with me. She provided detailed design drawings for the lighting system and the mounting method they use for paper negatives, which we adapted for the Real Ideal exhibition. I also consulted the Getty's head of preparations, Kevin Marshall, on possibilities for backlit illumination of light sensitive materials. <clears throat> Kevin had recently reinstalled some of the medieval stained glass in the collection with new LED light panels manufactured by Optic Arts in Los Angeles. He recommended we explore these with, for use with the negatives. This diagram <coughs> of the paper negative mounting and light panel system shows the backlit display method for the museum's objects. The negatives were housed between two sheets of True Views Optium Acrylic with a paper spacer. The paper spacer helped to prevent the negative from slipping out during handling and cushioned it from excessive pressure. The acrylic package was sealed with Scotch 3M800 prescription label tape and Marvel Seal aluminum foil to create an airtight package. Behind the negative, a sheet of conservation clear acrylic was added as a buffer between the light panel and the object. A neutral density filter and diffuser sheet were added to reduce the overall intensity and to evenly disperse the light across the panel. An archival mat and secondary sheet of optium were added to the front of the negative package to complete the look of a framed object. Each light panel was connected to a dimmer for careful light dose measurement. For the mount holding the negative, Stephen Hare, the lead mount maker for the exhibition, created custom templates for each negative. He imported high resolution image files into Adobe Illustrator and created a tracing of the negative. On the left is the resulting drawing with a detail of the top right corner shown in the center. Stephen then used the template to cut the paper spacers with our computerized mat cutter. Here's a short video showing the cutter in action. It's very precise changing blades and angles rapidly to cut within one one hundredth of an inch of the template specifications. The papers were quite thin and the contours of each negative were difficult to cut by hand without tearing the paper spacer. So to achieve these cuts, Stephen inserted the paper spacer sheet underneath a sheet of mat board with a two ply thickness, which offered some support and prevented the spacer from breaking or tearing during cutting. He's demonstrating the fragile nature of the paper spacer by pulling away the cut edges to reveal the contours of the negative. These details of two negatives that were displayed illustrate the precision of the cutter. Two, 
to determine what paper would be used as a spacer to hold the negatives. I took thickness measurements using a Mitutoyo micrometer. I used this information in visual inspection to select a conservation grade paper, such as silver safe or Japanese Kozo fiber with desired opacity and texture. I selected a paper that was just slightly thicker than the negative so that it would hold <clears throat> the negative in position but also prevent, a, pre prevent a, pre a pressure fit when sealed between two sheets of optium acrylic. Stephen made the final adjustments to the spacer using a small light box of magnification. Here he had to work quickly, only using the light panel for a few seconds to check the edges for an accurate fit. The success of the float mount system depended entirely on careful and precise fitting of the negative with the paper spacer that closely matched the contour of the object and its thickness. The acrylic sheets supporting the negative needed to be perfectly flat. Even a slight planar distortion in the glazing could cause gaps in the package creating movement of the negative. It was also critical that the final sealing tape around the negative package be applied without too much pressure or the glazing could distort slightly, creating a large air, air pocket, making the negative vulnerable to slipping out of position. This display view demonstrates the elegant design of the spacer and frame, which was supported by the lighting in the gallery. The use of a push button mechanism that illuminated only when the viewer pressed the button, combined with a dimmer to limit the intensity of transmitted illumination, along with the location of the electrical connection for the LED panel, which was placed inside the temporary wall and down by the floor, made display of these fragile objects possible. <clears throat> A schematic of the table cases shows how varied the negatives are in tone and image density, requiring that each negative be custom housed and backlit individually. The design shows a gray cover for the negatives, which was a painted aluminum overmat. This allowed for each negative to be shown floated. The cover prevented light leak around the edges of the negatives, but it also served to secure each object to the deck inside the case. During installation in the gallery, each negative was placed into the case separately with a custom fit light panel below it. The object packages were secured to the case deck with brackets as an added precaution for earthquake safety. Alongside Stephen and I in the galleries, were a team of preparators and lighting engineers to check each object placement and to confirm the correct light levels. This installation image of one of the table cases shows the final presentation with the gray overmat and push button activation panel. After the display period, the negatives were all removed from the temporary acrylic mounts for long-term storage. They are currently stored within unbuffered paper folders inside cylinder boxes. We have the original spacers stored in folders and the templates for each negative are also stored on the computer should new spacers be needed in the future. Paper negatives which were mounted for a traditional gallery display were over matted with a beveled window mat. The mat was carefully burnished along the bevel edge to reduce the risk of leaving an impression on the negative surface. The negative was mounted with a sling mount system using silver safe paper, which was folded into a Z-fold configuration. The Z-fold channel is typically a quarter inch deep, but can be narrower, and is used on all four sides so that the object sits inside paper channels, avoiding adhesive and providing cushioning for the edges of the negative. The strips of silver safe were adhered to the back mat with thermoplast tape. Fifteen negatives and two wax positives, a total of 17 objects from the collection, which are shown together here, were examined and evaluated for display in the exhibition. High resolution imaging of each object in reflected, raking, and transmitted illumination revealed many differences in the density and overall tone of each negative, as well as differences in the finishing treatment of the surfaces. The paper supports for the negatives and the coatings also vary broadly. Due to areas of discoloration and darkening for some objects, it was determined that microfade testing should be carried out on these materials before the display period. As expected, the results from microfade testing varied. Several negatives tested in a higher category for stability despite having coatings. However, four objects outlined here in red 
tested ultra sensitive and received a blue wool one rating, making them ineligible for display in the exhibition. <coughs> Excuse me. The Getty Conservation Institute collaborates with the museum to test light sensitivity of collection materials with a Whitmore microfade tester illustrated here. The microfade tester performs an accelerated light fading test that can provide predictive sensitivity information for a range of cultural heritage material, including photographs. The microfade tester has an intensity control for the, z the xenon light source, a spectrophotometer to measure color change, and an adjustable head to align the light and the spectrophotometer locations on the test area. Note that the exposed area is less than 0 0.5 millimeters. There's also a computer with spectral viewer software that records the data, which al allows us to see color change in real time. Shown here is an example of the graph illustration of the change in the spectra during testing. The yellow line, <coughs> which is at the top, is the first spectra recorded during testing, and the red line is the final measurement. Spectral viewer records the spectra of each test area for each color at the start and end of testing, which is plotted as the percent reflectance on the y-axis and the wavelength in nanometers on the x-axis. As shown in this example, a clear shift in the reflectance of this color indicates darkening has occurred in the tested area. Each spectra can also be defined in terms of LAB color space, as described by the International Commission on Illumination. L star measures the change of lightness in lightness of a color between black and white. A star measures the change from red to green. And B star measures the change from yellow to blue. Based on the initial and final LAB coordinates, the color difference, or delta E, can be calculated and used to assess perceptible change in works of art, such as photographs. <clears throat> when measuring collection objects, each discernible color including the paper support, is tested two or three times, and the results are averaged. Measurements of the image forming material can be taken in low density, mid-tone, and high density areas. The results of microfade testing, in this case, delta E, can be shown in, on the image, their map, which is mapping the areas tested with an assessment of the object's uh, sensitivity. In this example, the negative showed the highest color change in the lowest density areas. The blue wool rating for the object is assigned based on the most sensitive test area or the greatest change in delta E over a period of time. Typically, the sensitivity of a specific area of an object is compared to the microfading response of blue wools one to three. The ISO blue wool standard is a series of dyed wool cards <coughs> consisting of eight shades of blue wool. Blue wool one is extremely light sensitive, while blue wool eight is the most stable. Only the most sensitive blue wool cards, blue wool one to blue wool three, are used during microfade testing of photographs since they correspond to the appropriate range of light sensitivity. This example illustrates the results for the high and low density areas of the negative. The low density area is well above the blue wool one standard, indicating that there is a significant sensitivity to light in these areas. This object was assigned a blue wool equivalence of less than blue wool one. Illustrated here in transmitted and reflected illumination are the three negatives which received a blue wool one or lower rating with microfade testing. The object on the left attributed to low sec and on the right to flash her own. Both appear to have darkened at some point. Our first assumption after reviewing the microfade testing results was that the coatings were continuing to darken. But we also had results for the molar negative in the center, which is not, does not appear to be darkening. It does have a yellow tone overall, and a wax coating was detected during GCI's analysis. We then began to review the analytical results for the X-ray fluorescence analysis provided by Art Kaplan, which were described in detail during his presentation yesterday. So I won't repeat that here except to mention that we observed that each of these objects, along with the waxed positive by Lasek, have si significant peak areas for iodine and bromine. 
The presence of these elements within the image forming material may indicate, indicate that the images are unstable. The com combined results of microfade testing and X-ray fluorescence led us to the conclusion that these objects are ultralight sensitive and they were not displayed. Ultimately, nine negatives and one wax positive from the collection were selected for the exhibition. The negatives were installed with controlled lighting conditions that varied but did not exceed 50 lux of ambient exposure. To fulfill a lender requirement for one of the negatives, the preparations and security departments installed and recorded the cumulative light exposure for one of the backlit negatives with a digital timer. The timer recorded each push button activation throughout the display period, which was compiled into an Excel spreadsheet. The results summarized the number of button pushes by visitors, the average du duration and total seconds of exposure, and the total cumulative exposure. The total exposure for the negative was well below the object subjected to continuous illumination. The light exposure record, <coughs> excuse me, the exposure record provides useful information going forward for backlit display with LED light panels. It also gives us some insight into the visitor experience for this type of installation. Collaboration on a complicated installation such as Real Ideal was critical for its success. There were many experts that contributed knowledge and resources to the project, which ensured safe access of these fragile materials for the public. Karen and I have many people to acknowledge for the success of the exhibition and catalog, as well as our colleagues here in France for inviting us to present today. We'd like to thank Anne de Montenard and Bertrand Lavadrin for spearheading the technical studies and collaboration with the Getty and French institutions. We'd also like to thank our colleague Stephen Hare for his essential contributions to the exhibition and to this presentation. Working closely with our colleagues at GCI, especially Art Kaplan and Vincent Beltran, led to a greater appreciation for these unique objects, and we look forward to future collaborations. Thank you.